So now that we have a good understanding of the pathophysiology, um, epidemiology, and how to diagnose iron deficiency and heart failure, our next question is, well, how do we treat it? And so Dr. Margis and I will take this next segment to go over those things. I'll start by going over what the evidence currently is for using IV iron in patients with iron deficiency and heart failure, and then Dr. Margis will take over a more practical application of how we get that done. So although this has been a hot topic really in the past couple of years, it's been over a decade since we started looking at the role of IV iron in patients with heart failure. And you can see the early studies here had a couple of differences between what they were doing, what they were looking at. There were very low numbers. Generally, we're looking at patients with anemia. So this is before we had that standard definition that we just discussed. And early studies utilized iron sucrose with various different definitions. But even these early studies suggested that there could potentially be benefits in outcomes like quality of life and functional stas, uh, status. So with the Farrick hf study, this is the first time that we're really seeing that classic definition that we just went over for enrolling patients into a study for iron deficiency. So that ferritin less than 300 with a TSAT of less than 20% or ferritin less than 100. And again, this is a small study, used iron sucrose, but still found that there's a potential benefit in quality of life and functional class. Now, interestingly, we, we've done a lot of discussion so far about sort of the differences between anemia and iron deficiency and um, how patients, even regardless of anemia, still have poor outcomes when they have iron deficiency. And in Ferric HF, they actually found that the patients only benefited if they were anemic at baseline. So it sort of begged the question, should we only be using IV iron in patients that have low hemoglobins? And we'll stay tuned to, to answer that question with the FAIR HF trial. And this is one of the land, early landmark studies looking at iron deficiency in patients with heart failure. Again, utilized that standard definition and was the first to be a larger study using ferric carboxymaltose. And in this study, they still found a benefit in functional class and quality of life, but different from what we saw in Ferric HF. In this study, they found that those benefits were independent of whether or not patients were anemic at baseline. So even those patients who were admitted to the, to the study with a normal hemoglobin, they still benefited from getting IV iron. So the FAIR, or the FAIR HF study was only a couple months long, so the CONFIRM HF was aptly named to confirm those results with a longer follow-up. And so this study was done throughout a year. Again, about 300 patients using ferric carboxymaltose versus placebo and did indeed confirm the results from FAIR HF. So benefits in exercise capacity measured with six-minute walk distance, benefits in functional class and quality of life, and we saw that there was no difference or the benefits that were seen with ferric carboxymaltose were independent of whether or not patients were anemic at baseline. Now, Confirm HF was the first to, it wasn't necessarily powered to detect larger clinical endpoints like hospitalization, but it was the first to suggest that there could potentially be a reduction in hospitalizations when we use IV iron in this population. And we'll get to some of those studies that were powered to look at this in just a moment. And then lastly on the slide, we have Effect HF, which again enrolled patients with iron deficiency, but specifically was looking at exercise capacity as measured by peak VO2 and found that there was potential benefit with fair carboxymaltose in exercise capacity as well as functional class and quality of life. So even before we start to get to some of the trials that I'm going to discuss that are powered for things like hospitalizations and mortality, we see that there's pretty consistent evidence here that there's benefits in functional class, quality of life. So patients are just feeling better when they're getting IV iron to treat iron deficiency. Now, like I mentioned, um, these studies tended to be smaller and weren't powered for some of those larger clinical outcomes. So Affirm AHF is really the first study to be published to do this. And there was a couple other differences about Affirm AHF. And one being that this is really the first time that we're seeing a large randomized controlled trial of iron in patients who are currently hospitalized for heart failure. So most of the other studies we've talked about thus far are looking at our stable ambulatory patients. So this is a, over a 1,000 patients. They were hospitalized for acute heart failure. They had to have an ejection fraction of less than 50%, meet that standard definition for iron deficiency, and these patients were randomized to ferric carboxymaltose or placebo. Now, the study did not meet their primary endpoint 
which is a composite of heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death, but you do see that there is a signal toward benefit in heart failure hospitalizations, which was seen within a couple of months of discharge. There was no difference seen in cardiovascular death and really early improvement in quality of life, and that was seen within a month of patients being discharged and continued throughout several months after the discharge. Now, you're gonna hear me say a couple of times, um, talk about the COVID pandemic, because a lot of these studies are, all three of the large randomized controlled tr trials that I'm gonna be discussing were at some point um, enrolling patients during the COVID pandemic and were affected by the pandemic. And so there's gonna be some question here about how much those results were affected because during the pandemic, we had decreased rates of hospitalizations. Patients were told to stay home. They were less likely to present to the hospital. We may not have been as powered as we would have liked to see to see some of these endpoints. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on each of these studies. So the next study here is the Ironman study. And this is again, looking at ambulatory patients with a uh, injection fraction of 45% or less. And they had to have either a ferritin of less than 100 or a TSAT of less than 20%. They had a little bit higher ferritin cutoff in the study of 400. Um, so allowed for a little bit higher levels for patients to be enrolled. And this is the first large randomized controlled trial that's looking at an agent other than ferret carboxymaltose. So up to this point, all of our largest studies are looking at this one agent. And this study used ferric derisomaltose. So patients were randomized to either this or placebo. And what's interesting about this agent, uh, and as you can see, the dosing listed on the bottom of the slide, is that we can give pretty high doses safely very quickly. And so you're able to replete patients' total iron deficits with essentially one dose. And the primary endpoint here was recurrent heart failure, heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. Now, a couple of things about the patients that were enrolled in Ironman. Uh, it was mostly class two, functional class two and three patients, and their baseline transfer and saturation was about 15%. And you can see here, there was no reduction in the primary endpoint of heart failure hospitalizations or cardiovascular death, and neither of these endpoints, secondary endpoints individually had reductions. But like I mentioned, there is um, some speculation about the role of the COVID pandemic during Ironman. And so this uh, study actually agreed with the FDA to do a pre-specified COVID sensitivity analysis where they just looked at the patients who were enrolled prior to the COVID pandemic and wouldn't have been affected after March of 2020. And what they found was that there actually, in those patients, there was a reduction in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization for heart failure. And you can see here um, a hazard ratio of 0 0.76. The, the other thing that's important about Ironman to note is that this is a longer follow-up study and there was no difference in adverse effects with ferric derisomaltose compared to placebo. In fact, there was a lower risk of serious cardiac adverse events with ferric derisomaltose. So, the totality of evidence at this point is pointing toward potential benefit, but also that the risk is very low with using these agents. And so that leads us here to the HeartFID study, which is our most recently approved study. This study was um, just published a couple months ago and again is using ferric carboxymaltose, enrolling ambulatory patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and using our standard definition for iron deficiency. Now their dosing was based on um, the labeling for ferric carboxymaltose, which essentially takes into account weight and hemoglobin, but essentially most patients, unless you had extremely low body weight, are gonna get about 750 milligrams on day zero and 750 milligrams on day seven. And then they'll check iron indices every six months to determine if patients needed further repletion. Now the primary endpoint here was mortality, heart failure hospitalizations at one year, and change in six minute walk distance at six months. But what's really interesting about this primary endpoint is that they actually used a hierarchical win ratio. And so for those that are unfamiliar with this type of statistical analysis, it's becoming more common in some of the large um, randomized controlled trials in cardiology. And it's a way for us when we're using a composite outcome to try to prioritize certain Endpoints. So for example, we might not necessarily want to weigh death the same as what we would weigh for a change in, in six minute walk distance. So the way this works is that they'll take all of the patients in the treatment group and compare them to all of the patients in the placebo group for each outcome. So you see here death comparing all pairs between two groups for death 
If the patient died in placebo, but not in the treatment group, then the treatment group wins. If the opposite happens, then the treatment group loses. And if neither patient dies or there's a tie because both patients die, all of those patients move down to the next outcome to be analyzed. So all of those patients will be analyzed for hospitalization next. They do the same thing there, decides who wins, who loses. Anyone who ties, they move back down to six minute walk test to uh, determine if there's any differences there. So you can see for death here, there's, this accounted for 18% of the decisions with a win ratio of 1.2, 18% of decisions for hospitalizations as well with a win ratio of one, and then about 64% of decisions for six minute walk di distance with a win ratio of 1.1. So overall, it's about 52% wins for the ferric carboxymaltose group versus 47% wins or uh, losses for the ferric carboxymaltose group. And so you can see the unmatched win ratio at the bottom is 1.10, but importantly, the pre-specified uh, p-value for significance was 0.01. So this did not meet a statistically significant difference here. And that was similar for this important secondary outcome, which was cardiovascular death or first hospitalization for heart failure. You can see here that there was no difference between ferrocarboxymaltose and placebo. And so this garnered a lot of discussion, I think, because these results were surprising and not necessarily what we had seen with prior studies. And there's been a couple different um, ideas postulated about why we didn't see differences here. And one of those is that these event rates were just a lot lower than what we've seen in previous studies. And so potentially, maybe we didn't meet a power to see a difference. Um, this study, again, was primarily carried out throughout the COVID pandemic. And so you may wonder, well, why didn't they just do another COVID sensitivity analysis like Ironman? Well, the problem was so many patients in the study were enrolled during COVID that they wouldn't really have even had enough patients at that point to do a COVID sensitivity analysis. And so we just don't know if that would have been any different. Another thing that I'll point out about the HeartFit study is um, in terms of baseline characteristics, these patients had a baseline TSAT, mean TSAT of 24%. There's been a lot of discussion about our, our definitions for iron deficiency. What is the best definition? Who benefits the most from IV iron? And there's some evidence that the lower the TSAT, the more that you might benefit. And so critics of the study might say, well, the reason why we didn't see a difference here is because these patients ha already had enough iron and that's not the type of patient that we should have enrolled in the study. And um, Dr. Martis is gonna talk a little bit more about TSATs during his portion of the presentation. So putting some of the data together, there was a meta-analysis published at the same time as HeartFid looking at all three of our largest randomized controlled trials of ferric carboxymaltose. So this did not include Ironman. This was including Confirm, Affirm AHF, as well as HeartFid. And what they found was that there was a reduction in composite of cardiovascular hospitalizations and cardiovascular death, but not necessarily heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. But there was a reduction in the individual component of heart failure hospitalizations as well as cardiovascular hospitalizations um, and no difference in mortality, which looks a little bit more consistent from what we've been seeing with some of our studies. Potential benefits in hospitalizations, not necessarily with mortality. A couple of interesting points that were, were uh, brought up in this meta-analysis is who benefits the most, which we talked a little bit about already, but this suggested that potentially, again, those with the lowest TSAT tended to benefit more than patients with higher TSATs, and that the benefits were more pronounced in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathies than non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. And there's some information related to dosing, which, you know, as pharmacists becomes very important as we're trying to create protocols where about 17% of, only about 17% of patients required more than an initial dose of about 1,500 milligrams. This can be something that we keep in mind when we're trying to create those protocols for our patients. There's been other meta-analyses done, um, and these, this one in particular was done prior to our most recent studies. And I bring it up really to show more so the benefits on exercise capacity and quality of life. Particularly six minute walk test, we oftentimes think of 15 as being a clinically significant benefit in six minute walk test. And this meta-analysis showed double that with IV iron. So really significant benefits in exercise capacity as well as quality of life. 
And so I know a lot of us probably have a lot of focus, especially in the cardiovascular space, on big outcomes like mortality and hospitalizations, but I just want to put into context what that type of benefit in exercise capacity means. So uh, this is a study looking at exercise capacity as measured by peak VO2, which is, of course, a more precise measurement of exercise capacity compared to six-minute walk tests, and just comparing what IV iron offers in terms of improvements in exercise capacity compared to some of our GDMT. So um, our beta blockers, if anything, might decrease a little bit of exercise capacity, especially early on. Not a lot of um, evidence for benefit with SGLT2 inhibitors, some with our RAS inhibitors, and then by far the, the greatest in terms of GDMT is with our MRAs. But none of these compare to the type of benefits seen in exercise capacity with IV iron. And I certainly do not point this out to say that IV iron is more important than GDMT or should be prioritized over any of these agents, but rather just to show that even with all these agents that have great evidence for mortality, hospitalizations, and even quality of life, IV iron supplementation may be offering something that we're missing, even when we're having patients on strong uh, four-pillar regimens. And so I always get the question, okay, that's great, but wouldn't it just be a lot easier if I could use oral iron for my patient? And maybe, but the problem is that oral iron has not been shown to be effective. And so Dr. Vadaganathan did a good job of, of going over the role of hepcidin in patients with iron deficiency and how that affects the ability to absorb iron as well as mobilize it. And so this study, Iron Out HF, looked at using oral iron for patients with heart failure and iron deficiency. And they found that there was no benefit in terms of exercise capacity, quality of life, or natriuretic peptides at 16 weeks. And really interesting in this study, you can see in the graphs that those patients that had the highest hepcidin levels at baseline tended to have the least change in their iron indices, which sort of just um, confirms that hypothesis that hepcidin has a huge role in patients with heart failure on why oral iron is not benefic beneficial. So at this point, there's really no role for oral, oral iron in these patients, and we have to focus on IV formulations. So before I um, change this over to Dr. Martis, I'll just briefly go over our most recent guideline recommendations. So the ACC, AHA, HFSA did make recommendations related to iron deficiency in their guidelines from 2022. There's a class one recommendation for assessing patients for iron deficiency who have symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction which I find interesting because this is a class one recommendation, but I'm willing to bet that there's a ton of practices that are not actually doing a very good job of evaluating for iron deficiency in this population. There's a class 2A recommendation to give IV iron replacement to improve functional status and quality of life. Just keeping in mind that these guidelines were put out before HeartFid or Ironman were published. And then the class uh, three recommendation to avoid ESAs. And that's, of course, because of the red HF trial, which showed that these agents are not only not beneficial in this population, but that they can increase the risk of thromboembolic events. And then our most recent guidelines from, from the European Society of Cardiology, which includes our more recent evidence, not necessarily HeartFid, but Ironman, makes uh, a class one recommendation for iron supplementation for both HEFREF and mildly reduced ejection fraction for both symptoms and quality of life, and a class two recommendation specifically related to ferric carboxymaltose and ferric derisomaltose to reduce heart failure hospitalization. And of course, that's because those are the two agents that have large randomized controlled trial data for that particular outcome. And so with that, um, now that we understand the evidence, we can go ahead and switch over to Dr. Mardis for his portion of the presentation on practical application.